Welcome to Show Studio. We're here today to talk about fashion and its relationship with Brexit. Perhaps an unhappy relationship, but an important relationship nonetheless, because fashion is obviously an incredibly important industry um, within the UK, and it's something that needs to be discussed and talked about um, in relationship to what this deal that is being negotiated is going to have on our young designers and our amazing creative industry in London. Um, Part of this discussion is to try and speculate on some of the problems and the issues or the opportunities that might be caused um, by the Brexit deal. I think none of us here want to spend too long going looking back. I think it's very much about pragmatically and sort of openly discussing things that, um, that need to be given a forum. Obviously, we are aware that a lot of this is going to be speculation because a deal is still being negotiated. But I think it's really important that people who are working within the fashion industry feel like they're included in that discussion and that they have a... Um, a forum, as hopefully this will offer to, to voice concerns that are shared by not only them but other people that they're working alongside. I've got a brilliant set of people with me who are very qualified to have this discussion. And um, so before we sort of dig into the debates, I'll let everyone introduce themselves. Okay, so I'm Tamara Dinjik, and my background is as a fashion stylist, and more recently I've been working in politics. I'm Manira Mirza. I was Deputy Mayor for Culture and Education in London for eight years, and now I work on a range of projects to support the arts and creative industries. I'm Adam Manson. I'm the Chief Executive of the UK Fashion and Textile Association. We're the largest fashion and textile network in the UK, representing about 2,500 companies. I'm Phoebe English, and I'm a fashion designer living and working in London. Um, we produce all of our clothes uh, within the UK, and we work with menswear and women's wear. I'm Nick Knight, I'm a fashion photographer, a filmmaker, and I'm also the director of Show Studio. Welcome everyone. So the first question which I want to ask is, do we feel that there has been sufficient commentary and attention around the effect that Brexit is going to have on the fashion industry? Um, when I was looking into this panel discussion and doing my research, it was very, very hard to find voices within the political system who are actively discussing fashion. Um, or even textiles and garments and, and industries that, re that relate to that? And why is sufficient attention not being paid? Or would, or would people disagree? Do they think that, do they think that people have analysed sufficiently the effect this will have on fashion? I feel like you obviously feel that they haven't. I do. So I was um, on the Fabian Women's Network mentoring scheme. And then um, after it finished last year, my mentor offered me a role, which was initially supposed to be six months, it in fact went on for ten and ended about ten days ago um, in Westminster and I got in and it is a bit like being in or out um, and I got in and I had my pass and I had access to all areas and my real um, bugbear was Brexit so I went to every single event that I could and I literally kept panicking that where were the people that looked remotely like me that had a background in the creative sector um, so after one where Hilary Benn was speaking, um, where the room was a very different format to what you're seeing here, I asked him if he would allow me to introduce him to some people from the fashion industry and I tried to join up the dots with that and I think within about six days we had a round table, we had a full room of fashion people who were very concerned about Brexit and about the impact and the uncertainty and then from that we had another one which we held um, with Matt Hancock who's the culture minister mm. um, and there is I think I think it goes two ways I think it's a lack of lobbying mm -hmm. from the sector from the fashion industry um, possibly because then they're, they're possibly issue orientated and their concerns and also the workloads and job insecurity and lots of other factors and being international and mobile and then so I, and then there's a disconnect with entering into politics when mm -hmm. I went on the mentoring scheme they told me I was the first person that's ever applied from politics mm. um, and I think that's still the case now. from a fashion background from a mean? fashion background so I think there's a lack of people going into that world to try to learn about mm. it for whatever reasons and then there's, therefore there's a lack of connection and communication between the two and that's why there's been so much passion and it's it's one thing being upset on social media but unless the ministers and the policy makers and the advisors actually know what your issues are how can they understand 
and other sectors are very coherent in their lobbying mm. and much more cogent in, in that. So I you, think you're nodding issue. to a lot of that, Manira. Tell yeah. me your, your perspective, because this is obviously the field that you're working within. Yeah, I think that's right, um, that there is a... Um, there's often a lack of recognition in the sort of political world of Westminster of the importance of the fashion industry. Mm. I think there's more recognition of the creative industries as a whole, yeah, and mm. there are really effective lobbyists. I yeah. think the fashion industry does actually have very effective lobbyists, and they do try and get through. But there's a more general problem, which is that every single industry feels that it's not being listened to, yeah, sure. except with the possible exception of car manufacturing. Yeah, cars, <laughs> um, cars but well. I think that you know, the, you know, now we're on a journey, and mm. there is a, a lot of opportunity in the next year to really influence things. So that's important. That the sector comes together. Mm. Also, I think there are lots of alliances to be made with other types of industry. So, for instance, manufacturing as a whole, mm. recognising that there's a huge diversity within that label mm. and that many of the issues that face small designers and manufacturers yeah. will be common with other sectors. So rather than being quite siloed and only yeah. thinking mm. in terms of the industry as we know it as mm. or experience it, it's actually making those useful alliances. Uh, but then you, you raise an interesting point though, because you know making the alliances with other manufacturers, I think it's interesting and obviously very helpful in terms of the purely sort of pragmatic financial difficulties or, or issues that might be raised by Brexit. But I think an, there's the other side of that, which is more you know a sense of feeling within the creative community that maybe can't be associated with other manufacturers. You know, there's, there's two issues at play that are caused by Brexit. I think some of them are you know, really pragmatic financial problems that will hit young designers, and the others relate to you know, how London Fashion Week, how the designers working within Britain are perceived. And you know, Hadley Freeman wrote something in The Guardian. It was a very witty piece, but I thought it struck a really interesting note where she said, I think the ultimate problem is bigger um, than visas. It's much so much in fashion is about image and association. Italian labels suggest Dolce Vita glamour. French labels promise chic. British labels, more than any other country, play on national stereotypes, idea of heritage, the tweed, the crown, punkish rebellion, and most of all, a kind of gonzo creativity in which Britain has always taken pride. And what image in Britain do we now, in our post-Brexit era, project on the global stage? And I think that's really interesting, because a lot of, I think, what the fashion industry here is really proud of is a sense of diversity and being a melting pot and that people come to our amazing fashion schools from all over the, the world. So there's kind of these two problems. I explained that in a very long way. I hope that was coherent. Well, I think you're right. I mean, there's all sorts of issues. It depends which part of the industry that you're talking about. But I think in terms of <coughs> going back to your original question about has there been enough lobbying, there's been an awful lot of work that UKFT and in conjunction with the British Fashion Council have done behind the scenes. Now, we might not have been waving the flags from the barricades, but we have been talking to pretty much every single government department, every single minister. And have they been receptive? Service. And even down to the Prime Minister. You know, I've, I've had conversations with the Prime Minister about the impact of Brexit. And you know, it was a very short conversation, <laughs> but you know, getting those points across. They are listening. Mm -hmm. I mean, I will say that they are listening. Whether they're going to make a difference, we'll have to wait and see. Mm -hmm. um, but there has been a lot of um, talk there's been a lot of understanding, and, and I think you know where we probably haven't done ourselves service is that we haven't necessarily pushed forward the industry before Brexit. Mm -hmm. So when you go and talk to people and tell them that there's 110,000 people in manufacturing, that 70 billion pounds is spent on the high street in terms of clothing, mm -hmm. that we make all sorts of things from Formula One nose cones to the fantastic creations that Phoebe puts down the catwalk, everyone is completely gobsmacked about mm -hmm. the size of the industry, and that's where we possibly missed a trick beforehand mm. um, yeah. but you know and, and it's, you know we are working with again a lot of the other trade associations the engineering employers federation which mm. is proper manufacturers mm. you know mm. um, again the, the car industry we work with quite closely the creative industries federation mm. so and it's what surprised me is that the what I thought were fashion specific issues mm -hmm. actually apply across every single sector it doesn't really matter whether you're talking about a fashion model um, or whether you're talking about an opera singer mm. the, the issues are exactly the same and so a lot mm -hmm. of the industries have what are your main similar. concerns so you know when you're speaking to these figures what are you pushing what are you what are you particularly if you sort of give about? it a sort of you know, 30 seconds pitch it's about talent so that's both the ability to let students from the EU come into our fantastic fashion colleges where a lot of sort of you know the companies like Erdem and America Transu those sort of people mm -hmm. but it's also about accessing the fantastic manufacturing talent that's in the European Union as mm -hmm. well and if you just take London as an example there's 13 and a half thousand people making things in London for mm -hmm. the fashion and textile industry over 70 percent of those are Europeans because mm -hmm. they have the latent skills it's still taught in schools we don't have that in the UK so 
talent is an absolute key priority. Intellectual property is another one. So the, the protections that the EU intellectual property rights give us are absolutely mm. fantastic. And if we lose those, we run a real risk of um, the, the design industry in particular. Yeah, I believe the British Fashion Council have already said that this could effectively put an end to London Fashion Week because if people had to show in Europe first to have this intellectual property sort yeah, of I mean, Very security. basically, <coughs> currently if you, send a catwalk, if you send a collection down a catwalk at London Fashion Week, it is protected throughout the whole of the EU. Mm -hmm. Unless we replace that protection as we leave um, the EU, then they do run the risk of not only having to protect that um, unregistered design mark in the UK that also have to have to register it in the rest of the European Union as well. Mm -hmm. So there's that. International trade is the third one mm -hmm. and that's both imports and exports because whilst I'm a huge believer in UK manufacturing um, and I support a lot of people who make things here, the vast, vast, vast majority, 94% of the stuff that we all buy as consumers is imported from overseas. Mm -hmm. So it's not only about how do we access the European Union as a huge market? The EU accounts for 74% of all of our exports. Mm -hmm. It's how do we make sure that we still have access to sourcing countries like Bangladesh. We import two billion pounds worth of garments at wholesale prices from Bangladesh. Mm -hmm. We're the biggest importer from Bangladesh of everyone in the world. Now if we currently, the reason that we bring in so much, and everyone else join in, sorry I'm rabbiting <laughs> away, is that we get duty free access to Bangladesh. So we can bring that in without any tariffs whatsoever. When we step out of the EU, and if we haven't got an agreement in place that replaces that, that tariff-free access, the WTO t tariffs that we might have to move to is 25% out mm, of yeah. Bangladesh. Put on top of that the 20% currency differentials that we've had mm. that happened immediately <laughs> we dropped out of Brexit. We're talking about stuff coming out of Bangladesh being 45% more expensive than it currently yeah. is. Mm. It's going to impact everyone in the supply chain. So the, the people working in Bangladesh and you know the, the retailers have done such a hard job of trying to increase the way that they work with manufacturers in Bangladesh, increasing the, the, the working conditions of Bangladeshis. If we have to pull out of there because we now have to move to a cheaper sourcing environment, it's going to have all sorts of impacts. So mm -hmm. those, are the, those, are the, those are the things, the key things. It's skills and talent, IP and international trade. Mm -hmm. And then there's a series of other things behind like that. The but those are the three market. key ones. Mm -hmm. So what were you going to say? I'd say like the single market, but yes. So when, when the government has, um, which I'm, I'm sure they're hoping won't happen to say that no deal is better than a bad deal and we go to World Trade Organization levels, that would severely impact the industry because anything that's made, even if it's made in Britain, there are components of that product which are imported. Mm -hmm. So if you have tariffs added to say the, the cotton or the thread or the button or the zip and it's import, uh, you know, and the whole customs, mm -hmm. um, Issue. I think it opens up a whole level of nightmare upon nightmare for the industry. Mm -hmm. um, so I think it, 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 you know, it's more a case of consistently putting across that message and linking that message up and saying it till it's really understood. Mm -hmm. Because you've, you're working with ministers who haven't come from that background, mm -hmm. and to have a, an, an, an understanding of other areas where they're much more ex expert, which is completely understandable. Mm -hmm. um, I think there are similarities yeah. though, and this the, there the are point I was making earlier, and I, even though ministers may not have a specialist knowledge of the fashion industry, they understand extremely well, from, from what I have experienced, um, how internationalised so many supply chains are, yeah. mm -hmm. and they recognise that there is a challenge to going to the WTO Absolutely. tariffs. However, um, just to, um, to present the other side, and I do recognise there's so much uncertainty, and there is nervousness, understandably mm -hmm, mm -hmm. nervousness. Um, there are also potential opportunities and um, you know you said earlier Lou about how uh, there's a great deal of fear that we'll become an inward nation we'll stop trading that we'll you know retreat from the world I think that it's the other way around actually and I you know will come out and say I you know I supported Brexit and I argued for it because I think that actually we need to turbocharge our engagement with the rest of the world mm -hmm. and even though this is not the ideal way to do it ideally I would have liked us to be able to reform our relationship with the EU we, we couldn't um, they tried and I think we have to try and put our best foot forward and go forward and just try and initiate trade deals with uh, both with the EU and with other countries we do have a trade deficit with the EU it's not a guarantee that they'll be sensible enough to want to come to the table and do a proper deal. Mm -hmm, yeah. um, but there are certain advantages. And I think that as with all economic uncertainty, practical uncertainty that faces business, and in fact, it's not just Brexit. There are other things that face London, small designers, the cost of living, affordability, housing. 
As with all these things, you have to have a balanced assessment, I think, about the strengths of any sector. And actually, the UK fashion industry is in a very, very strong position, actually. It has an ability to be resilient. Not every single individual business will, um, uh, will have that sense of confidence, but as a sector, actually, there are, you know, there are a lot of positives. And the fact that the brand of being made in Britain is really strong, that there is a huge interest in other markets where we do not currently have a trade deal, like China, um, with all its attendant risks around but copyright. Just, just to interrupt you a bit. So this is post-Brexit you're talking, but pre-Brexit, so it takes back two or three years ago, what was the good idea about coming out of Europe? Are you suggesting that actually how you looked at things two or three years ago, you looked at it and thought, well, actually, we shouldn't really be part of this union. We should be free and we should be able to trade our people because that's better. Understand now that perhaps, you know, we can look at other alternatives to trading with Europe so we can widen that way. But I'm trying to get what baffles me and has right down from the beginning is why this was a good idea. <laughs> uh, when I first went to Parliament, to, um, Tamara asked me to or asked us all to come down. They came down. I said to all the ministers there, and it was Hilary Benn and Matt Hancock and um, some other Labour MPs, um, Okay, so we've said some negative things because obviously we're all very worried. So what's the good stuff? Mm. And they all sat there and <coughs> said nothing. Okay. And well, Matt Hancock said, well, to be honest, it's not going to sound too good, but Donald Trump's looking very favourably at us, favourably at us for a trade deal. Okay. <laughs> that was the reason to come out of Europe. So I, what I'm trying to get to, I'm, I, I, start, I'm, I lived in Europe as a child, so I uh, lived in Paris, I lived in Brussels, so I've always felt more European than just British, so I have to feel nationality at all. But I've always sort of wanted... Why was this a good idea? Why did we want to do this? What, what was so bad about it that we thought we should take all these sacrifices, that we should have all this pain that we're about to go through, apparently, to get to what? So nobody's sold me that idea yet. No okay. politician has come on and said to me, you know, the really good thing about leaving Europe is this, and that's what we should all be doing. I know it's a horrible process, and it's going to hurt people, but in the end we'll be... Uh, and it's worth doing. So I, I'm not trying to put you on the spot here, because none of the politicians have managed to answer this in public or in private. So I'd just like to, to feel that there was some good reason in some people's minds for doing this, other than you know, the reasons of perhaps you know, xenophobia or immigration, all those sort of things, which I don't, you know, as you can sure I can guess, I uh, don't agree um, with. I mean, I'm, uh, without wanting to reopen the debate on Brexit, and no. I'm conscious that other people no, no, haven't no, had a chance to speak. Not to um, do that, but. but I think, no, I think it's a legitimate question, even after the referendum, why does 17.4 million people decide to vote in this way? And, um, I can you know, really only speak for myself personally. No. It certainly wasn't because I was xenophobic. No. Um, I think that hopefully that is reasonably clear. And um, you know, I do think we should have a very strong international engagement with the EU and the rest of the world. Um, I think there are very practical business reasons, actually. The business community was very divided. There was, you know, there was a, um, a strong uh, uh, constituency within the business world that felt that actually being part of the EU was hindering them in, in a large way to do with regulation, but also just generally the, the macroeconomic situation. Um, you know, there is a lot of uncertainty around the euro and the crisis of the euro mm -hmm. and the impact that that would have on the UK if it remained in the EU. Um, but I think there's a broader political reason that motivated me. You know, I believe that the EU is fundamentally not democratic. And for democratic and political reasons, but also practically, I think a country that is able to direct its own regulation, that's able to direct its own trade deals, that's able to take control of these many different areas, including immigration. And I believe passionate immigration, I think it's a good thing. Mm. But I think that it should be something that we control and we should mm. be able to decide. Those are fundamental reasons. And I think sometimes what happens in the creative industries in the echo chamber that we are, mm. that a lot of people very quickly reduce the reasons for leaving to being about xenophobia, mm -hmm. retreating mm -hmm. from the world. You know, about one million people, it's estimated, from ethnic minority backgrounds voted to leave the EU. From their perspective, the EU is not the be all and end all of internationalism. Leaving the EU is not leaving Europe. I still think we should have uh, mm -hmm. a good relationship with, with Europe and with EU member states. But it is about recognizing that we have over the last 40 years, reduced our relationship with many other countries, that there is an opportunity here. I certainly don't underplay the risks and the, 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 you know, the, the dangers ahead, um, but we are in the position we're in. Three years ago, I didn't think that we would be leaving the EU, to no. be honest. I thought that would be reform. And if you could wind the clocks back and have the decision you wanted, would you still go for it? Would you still say everything you know now, you'd still want to go? Well, actually, you know, I think you know, before the referendum during the campaign, um, there were lots of things asserted about what would happen to the UK immediately after the vote to leave, and then after Article 50 was triggered. And a large number of those things did not happen. Um, and 
you know, consumer confidence hasn't gone completely. It, it may well go. Inflation is going up, but it's going up across the whole of Europe. The UK is regarded as the fastest growing of the G8 economies. Um, many banks, including you know, Bank of England, the Treasury, have revised their economic forecasts because actually what's happened is that the economy has not tanked in the way that people predicted. It doesn't mean that there aren't risks, and I'm completely aware of them. Personally, I think that the political benefits are worth it. But I, I do think we're in a much more resilient position than was, than was painted during the campaign. So actually, I don't feel a sense of regret. And I, the evidence shows that the vast majority of people who voted leave also don't feel regret. And in fact, many people who voted remain think that we should carry on and now leave and, and recognise and accept the decision. So well, we the sense of regret that. doesn't really, isn't think, really out I mean, there. In terms of that sort of broader general economic view, do you not think that there might be an element of the UK economy is a bit like Wiley Coyote? You know, we've gone off the edge of the cliff, our legs are still running around like crazy. We just haven't realised that we're not actually on top of anything and we're just going to crash down and the TNT safe's going to fall on our heads. I like that very precise scientific analysis that... I mean, it's the best I can do. <laughs> but I, it, I think it does demonstrate where I think we possibly might be. And I don't think, particularly in our industry, a lot of the economic impacts of Brexit haven't yet hit. Exactly. Well, a lot was made that there was an immediate boost to the fashion industry because obviously people yeah. were coming to buy cheap goods, which obviously isn't a long-term sustainable no. benefit to but the fashion industry. Although well, it has boosted manufacturing. But, I mean, well, you know, it has point, made a, a, a point, difference. Yeah, up to a point, it's boosted time. manufacturing. But, but to pick up the earlier point, I mean... Whilst there is a resurgence in UK manufacturing, particularly in the garment side, that is absolutely fundamentally fed by European workers working yeah. in, in the factories here. Mm -hmm. And then the second point is to pick up that you know we don't do everything here, and we can't do everything yeah. here. We can't we can't grow silk here. We have to import it. There isn't a single zip manufacturer yeah. in the UK. So there, there are elements. You no. Know, are there opportunities from, from the result of Brexit? Absolutely there are, and, and mm. a growth in UK manufacturing is absolutely one of them. But in terms of going back to where we started, what we need from government is, you know, number one, please can we have a reassurance that those people that are in the from the EU that absolutely. are in the UK okay. mm. can have the right to stay here, end of. It's not a negotiating thing, it mm. shouldn't be a negotiating thing. They deliver a huge amount to this, to this country in all sorts of ways, and particularly to this industry. And you know, picking up on that immigration point, I mean, I think on, again on a broader political view, I've heard some really unpleasant things said to people about, or oh, now we voted to leave, you lot will be out of the country. And I think there's a lack of understanding within a, a large section of the population that controlling EU immigration will only control 50% roughly mm -hmm. of the total immigration that comes into the UK. So there's still going to be an immigration issue, and, and if we couldn't control it pre-Brexit, how are we going to be able to control it post-Brexit? Mm. You know, the customs union is going to have a huge impact. You know, we only make 90 million customs declarations a year across the whole of all industries. And if we can't, if we're going to miss out on that opportunity to make one customs declaration in Europe for the whole of the EU, we're going to have to get to a whole... Mm. Sorry, I'm not... No, no, I can come back on this point, but I don't want to, because I know Phoebe hasn't had a chance yeah, to speak let's, in others. Let's, yeah. Phoebe, let's go to you. I'm interested to hear your... Well, yeah, I was just... Um, I've just been thinking about what you said about the talent um, aspect. It's just something I'm, I'm quite, I'm actually quite concerned of, and I think that will be something that um, will be something that will, if people can't come here from other countries, will it will be something that will be a very slow detrimental um, effect on the fashion industry. Um, if I think about my education at St Martin's and uh, the, the kind of the people that were, were in my class for example I think there was you know three of us from the UK I mean it was that that international mm. and that school is you know it's a very famous fashion school has a brilliant reputation and people come from all over the world to study there mm. um, and for me, that was that was the um, the main the main benefit of going to mm. that university was to be surrounded by people from every country in the world. Mm. It was such a rich. It was so rich. And would you say that those conversations have yeah, sort of fed into your aesthetic? Definitely, and because you learn from your peers, and I think that's one of the the main standout points for for uh, St Martin's education and for for a London education or for 
sort of any university education to be to have the luxury to be surrounded with with your with a peer group that's from all over the world it's a really rich experience mm. that brings so much to your practice and the thought of that not being a pos possibility mm. just just to see seems to me totally bizarre that you know that a, a, a career that should be based on stimulation and um, imagination and inspiration to not be able to to have those opinions and those life experiences that is so rich across the world and not be able to train alongside them um, is just a crying awful shame. And I think I think it's sorry, sorry. But no, go ahead, go ahead. Um, I mean, I don't, think, I don't think there is a majority of 17.4 million people who want to stop international students coming to the UK. In fact, the largest number of students from abroad is actually from China, it's, you know, in London, certainly. Um, it's, a, you know, it's a very big uh, population. Leaving the EU is not about saying to the world, we don't want your students to come here. And in fact, I think, you know, I'd like us to... charge more, though. Students from the European Union will be charged a lot more if we're outside the European Union. Yeah, so but I... So fees will go up. Yeah, so but I do, th I do think... But, but I do think it's fair that we have a less discriminatory system between uh, the EU and non-EU uh, people who want to come. So if you talk to someone like James Dyson, for instance, he will say there are many engineers that he would like to bring over from India. It's much, much harder for them than it is for someone coming from the EU. So it both affects his business, but he, I mean, he's also the, um, involved very much with the RCA. You know, he's got strong universities' interests. He's given a lot financially to, to universities. He believes very passionately that we discriminate against non-EU people. In fact, most of the students who come from the EU are white, and he recognises that, you know, actually this does not send a great message out to the rest of the world. So I would argue for a more humane and more fair immigration system, which recognises talent, recognises students, which allows us to welcome the world, but is controlled. And I don't think that... Uh, you know, the current government always has the right message about immigration, but I, you know, this isn't about the current government, it's about taking control over this area, and I think that's what politics is about. We're debating now what we think our immigration systems could, should be, uh, and, you know, it's all to play for. That's what we should be lobbying for. Just a question on the international students, and forgive me if I don't have um, sufficient information, but I'm, I'm curious to understand why sort of, you know, penalise or charge more the EU students rather than looking better at the, our relationships with non-EU international students coming in? So non-EU students pay three times Yeah. what EU students um, and UK nationals pay. I but but why, what I'm asking, and the point that you just made is you're acting like, you know, to make everyone's fees the same, but why not make it easier for Chinese students to pay less than bump everyone up to their because fees? they offset the costs to run the colleges. I just worry. But, you, but, you, but the point is that this is a conversation you can now have. Universities can now have the conversation about levelling the fee, if they wish. They can, you know, they can actually re reflect in a non-discriminatory way, mm -hmm. which they haven't been able to up till now. Um, you know, and there are lots of different areas where we discriminate against non-EU people in that way. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I agree. There's no guarantee that we become. You know, international that we, we do these things, but there's also no guarantee that it will become worse, that we will be turning away people. But I and there's no evidence that the British public actually wants that. And if you look at polls, yeah. what the British public want, they want students to come. They recognise. But we're know, thinking a lot about what the what we you know what the British people want, you know, from the public through from the public through to, to sort of politicians and those working within the colleges. But I think it's a perception issue as well. And yeah, you know, one of the things that people want to come here, like what the experience for, yeah, you're well, talking for about. For example, like I have very strong EU students um, who've come to to kind of train with me for a few weeks and and having conversations with them where they where they're asking me. You know, I, I really wanted to do an MA here, but I don't know if I'll be allowed, and I don't feel welcome here. And you know, really considering going to a different country to do a fashion MA, mm. and not London, which is crazy because London is, you know, it's the place to study fashion. Mm. It's very. And if you look at our fashion week, the people who bring us so much attention are often European. You know, like yeah. we've talked about America Transi, she's Greek. Marcus yeah, Almeida, a Portuguese. And do you do you have concerns that those people won't want to come? Why would you want to go to a place that has sent a message that you're not welcome? Well, I, I have concerns that what happens is that universities at the moment are. Uh, 
telling the world that Brexit is about closing off from the world. Mm -hmm. So I think that they interpret figures with a very negative spin, which is counterproductive because it actually puts people off. And in fact, before Brexit, when I was at the mayor's office, I remember there was a long discussion about the impact that um, uh, the, the, the government's proposals on immigration were having on Chinese students. And I remember mm -hmm. the promotional agency for London was saying, you know, actually, it's a little bit counterproductive because we send out the message to the rest of the world that we don't want you. And in fact, we need to tell people, no, you're, you're still welcome. I think you know, the, mayor of London, the current mayor of London saying that London is open is a good message. We mm -hmm. want to reinforce that Brexit doesn't stop us from wanting to bring in talent. And in fact, there's nothing that the government has done so far that I know um, which has said that they don't want universities to have international students. So th there's a very strong economic reason, but also a cultural reason. Uh, and we could, we, we, you know, we'd be better off trying to project positively. I think sometimes people, for understandable reasons after the campaign, have tended to focus on the negative, partly because of their own feelings. But it's, it, it is counterproductive when we're trying to project to the world. So 14, I've got written here that EU funding um, equals 14.2% of research funding. I mean, that this was from a, a, a meeting that I went to. Obviously, if we came out of the single market, I've also got written down, we come out of the funding called the Erasmus Plan, yeah. which would have a huge effect. And I'm very much Remain, that's obvious. But if I honestly felt that the UK talent, education system, manufacturing, factories were really being well funded, we could go back to 40 years ago when we had a million people, I read, in manufacturing in this country, where we had a really well funded education system that was pumping people in to fill the jobs of today and tomorrow. I just wouldn't be quite so panicked, but mm -hmm. I really panic. You know, schools are looking at funding cuts, which there's a 6% in one year ARP GCSE decline. There is something like 33%, uh, no, what is it? 41% um, down in design and technology, 23% fall in craft. So already we're going to have an issue mm -hmm. because for the jobs of today, we are not going to have the talent, the domicile talent. And if immigration is going to go down, absolutely then we need to be pumping money into education, mm. not hitting them with cuts. Mm. It just, it, it, to me, that just doesn't add up. Because if you're looking at, okay, we are going to be lo uh, losing people. Of the people that I um, interviewed, a third said that they were prepared to leave if they, the single market was closed off to us. And another third said that they were considering it. I know from several people that I've spoken to in the last couple of weeks that they are looking at Lisbon, for instance, which is mm -hmm. making very inviting messages to them about, we've already got the factories, mm -hmm. it's a nice quality of life, China. you know, mm. et cetera, et cetera. I'm sure they've made overtures yeah. to you. They certainly have mm. to a lot of people I know. It, I, I just wouldn't feel quite so panicked. But not only that, China is pumping money into the creative education mm -hmm. system, meaning, I'm sorry, but it doesn't add up. They are, are in, in a generation's time, those factory owners that have a talented child are not going to send them to London for an education. They are just going to keep there and we are going to be irrelevant unless we absolutely strategize creatively towards something really fundamentally engaging so that there is some kind of creative thinking around solutions that absolutely inject the most we can and, and, and lead on technology, lead on design and lead on creative thinking and really come up with some energetic solutions. Mm. Because it almost has to be a very thoughtful globalisation because that's now the solution we're going to have to find. And mm. I hope that that's why the government and, and, and the mayor's office, etc., listen, mm. because that's what worries me. Is, you know, a, a decline in education in the creative industries where we don't have a millinery course, we don't even have a bookbinding course, and they mm. are overrun with jobs that they can't meet, then where are we going to be mm. in 20 years' time? You, was, you were sort of nodding to a lot of that, Phoebe. Yeah, I mean, if people can't come here, Fashion Week will be empty. There will be no one showing. They mm. just won't be. If you look at the names on the list of Fashion Week, the designers showing, they're not all like... Yeah, they're not all UK nationals, they're from all over the world and the reason we have one of the best fashion industries in the world is because the best students from all over the world and all over Europe can come here to study. And they want to come here And they here want as well. to come here yeah, to study I think because there's the two levels. You like know, once they're here, they are we you know, in, in fashion, they're part of British fashion. Mm. They're part of our industry and you know, it's 
it's an all-embracing industry and it always has been. It, it was found, it, the, the industry as we know it was founded by a British man going to France yeah. and founding Couture in France. So it's two European nations which came together to, to, found, to fund uh, an industry which is now, you know, a multi-billion dollar thing everywhere around the world. And that was, that was two, a British man and a French nation coming together. From its inception, it has been about, about countries coming together. That's how it's always worked. French lace sold in London, Scottish mills selling their tartan in, in Paris. You know, it's, that's how it works. It's mm. actually how the industry works. So if that becomes harder, or if indeed it becomes not possible for people to come here, how on earth is it going to run and what kind of industry is it going to even be in the end? Would you consider moving? Are those offers that you're having at the moment, are those things you're discussing? Well, yeah, there are countries that are going to, they're going to, they're going to pick up on the fact that, you know, they can, they, they've got nice things to offer designers to, to try and lure them. And, you know, there are countries like China is a huge emerging fashion, um, nation i mean it's going to really explode and i don't think any of us are going yeah. to be ready for that yeah. and that they're, they're they're going to be able to offer the money for designers to go over there mm. um and if there's no incentives for them to stay here then why should we stay here can i can i just make i think you know sure. i i completely agree that um it's a competitive marketplace out yeah. there there are lots of cities who it's are you know, trying to build their industries and grow their industries and we've already got a really successful one we can't be complacent, we could, we could easily lose it. But I think the point about funding from government and having a more forward-looking strategic approach to nurturing our industries, and you know, there is, a, there is an industrial strategy set up by government, creative industries is put down as a priority sector. The point I would make is that in order for governments to be able to give that kind of funding, it needs to have a strong economy. And there is a fundamental risk with remaining in the EU. Um, it, is, it is economically risky both to remain as well as to leave. Mm -hmm. And the programmes like Erasmus, the research funding, that comes from the EU, but that money mm. comes from somewhere. We are a net contributor of that yeah. funding. That funding will come back. How we use that funding, how we make decisions about uh, our tax revenue and how, you know, in the next 10 years, what that will look mm. like, growing our tax revenue, hopefully, um, is the stuff of politics. That is what it is to go forward, to lobby, to be part of a debate. Mm. Now, you know, you could say, oh, well, things were, you know, at least things were okay. You know, with the status quo was uh, at least certain. We knew what it was. A, it wasn't certain. There's no certainty of remaining. Um, there were many risks attached to that. But B, you know, the, the resilience of the creative industries as well, and its ability to adapt, is one of the things that is quite unique in Britain. It does have some strengths that other countries don't have. And I do think actually it's quite well positioned to go forward. And just the only way in which government can really support, at the level I think it should, mm -hmm. is if it has the money to do that. But weirdly, it's, I'm sorry. So no, go ahead. It, it's, not, it's a cultural thing as well. It's not just about economics and not just about government backing fashion, which of course it should, but also it's a cultural thing. You know, London especially has been a cultural melting pot you know, since the end of the war. You know, you've had you know, all these different, you know, you had Francis Bacon in Soho, you had you know, all, you know, all, all the different generations of, of creators have come here, not because of government funding, because London was such a great, vibrant, cosmopolitan city. And not because of the EU. You know, they came before the EU was created. They did and come before it's, the EU, but, but my, my point is, is if this country suffers, which it will do, by, well, certainly the fashion industry and the creative industry will suffer, then they will go elsewhere. Mm. And, and, and Cities like London don't always last forever. Mm. Look at the huge, you know, um, art movement in Vienna. No one really goes to Vienna anymore. You know, cities have their peaks. But you're speculating about what And this could be the down, what downside happen. of it. It's not about government funding. It's about the cultural attitude within the city. Mm. And if we turn to a city which isn't welcoming to foreigners, that doesn't feel that way, just culturally, in that case, we'll lose something vital. How much money you stick into something, it isn't going to work. But I do think that you are 
making an assumption that it will stop being international. I absolutely uh, don't believe that. I don't believe that. I have no idea what's going, going to happen, so yeah. it's very, very hard just to say it'll yeah. all be fine, because of course mm. there's a nagging feeling that actually yeah. there's lots of reasons saying it won't be fine. But you're assuming the worst case scenario. But, well, I think it's a very it's different scenario to one that I think you know, we don't have evidence that is really mm. going to happen. But this comes back to the original question about, so we've done lots of lobbying to government, mm. and this, is a, this, is a, you know, this isn't a party political point at all, this is a much broader political point, is that Yes, we've been pushing the messages in, in terms of where our areas of concern are. What we haven't had back in any shape or form is, is a yes, we're hearing you. Yes, it's going to be okay for students. Yes, we understand that manufacturing will need more help and support, possibly. Yes, your export drive will need more help and support. And yes, we'll be able to do all those things because we now have the money that was going into the EU that we can now direct in our own national interests. And we just haven't had that. I mean, I think that's why there's so much negativity or um, fear about yeah. what the future is because we haven't been no, in any way so so shape or form yeah. by anybody of any political persuasion That's reassured true. that yes it's all going to be okay yes we understand that the US could be a fantastic market for you and yes we will be doing our best to get tariff-free access to the US that we've never had before. Yes, we could be doing well, a lot of I don't know if that's true, actually. I mean, I'm not here to defend government at all, um, or any political <laughs> party, but you know, if you look at the manifestos, if you look at what's been said about Global Britain, I think every single uh, political party that is at least accepting the, the referendum result, you know, there are one or two who don't. But you know, it's a very clear commitment and investment from um, certainly the Conservative and I believe the Labour Party uh, in their manifestos to support an exports programme. You know, it's a very clear line in there. Now, it might be that it's not getting cut through in the media, but I don't get the impression that any of the political parties are saying we want to stop Britain from I'm, being an international I didn't player. Say they, they were going to, I didn't say that they were saying they were going to stop. What they're not coming across in any meaningful way from an industry's perspective is what the benefits would be and that they're 100% behind those industries. And I, you know, I think I mean, if you take the, the, I mean, take, the, take, the, take the export thing as, as a key example, I mean, yes, it is a specific item in the Labour manifesto that they will ring fence, not increase, ring fence the support they give for trade show access programmes, which is the money that goes to help smaller companies go to overseas trade shows. Yeah. Right. The entire budget across all industries is less than 8 million quid. And, and the fashion industry's budget of that, which is the biggest slice of all, is £650,000. Mm. That's all that the government currently give. So all that Labour Party is saying is that they will ring fence mm. that. Yeah. Reference that against what our European competitors do, and currently there also are mm. European partners, but there will be even more so our European competitors. I mean, some of you have heard this statistic before. The, European, the Italian fashion industry, Italian government, put $20 million mm. behind the promotion of Italian fashion in New York for one season, and yeah. we get six hundred and fifty thousand pounds to promote mm. UK fashion across the entire That's globe. A, you know, it's again, it's a broader political point. This isn't about Conservatives or Labour. There needs to be a much clearer message mm. coming from the government, coming from Westminster, that yes, we're listening to you which is one point, and yes, we're going to support you. And I think that's the bit that's missing, and that's why we're all still feeling so nervous. Yeah. I, and I completely, you know, I can understand that. Um, but I think it, it, my concern is that by uh, projecting the worst case scenario, we, uh, we accidentally or inadvertently project a message out to the world as well. So I believe, I, I, you know, I completely believe you, and I think you're, you're right that the government can and should do more. And hopefully after the election, there'll be a bit more stability for them to do that. Uh, I, mean, I, accept, I accept the point, but you know, highlighting things like, if we don't get a replacement deal for X, Y, and Z, the direct impact will be clothes are 45% more mm. expensive. That's yeah. not me scaremongering. No, no, that is the reality of what yeah. the situation would become. Yeah. And, and yeah. It's so I think, for instance, you, know, there are, you have sister associations in the rest of Europe. I would like to see the creative industries working with partners around the rest of Europe to lobby their governments, to lobby the EU to get us a good deal. Right? So car manufacturers are talking to their supply chain in other countries mm -hmm. and getting them to lobby the German industry associations that will lobby the German government. And, that's, and I that's think it's, it is recognising yeah, mm -hmm. that you know, there, are, there is another side to this negotiating mm -hmm. table and exerting political pressure. Mm -hmm. But what tends to happen in the media discussion in the creative industries is a general, our government is not doing anything and therefore it's all going to go. Do you wrong. think that the government has given an adequate message back to those to those media so media organisations within the creative industries to have anything to report to be positive about? Probably not, but in a way, the, what is the report? Why would we're they, not in a negotiating. But why would they then it? change their tune? That, that's, we had a meeting with Matt Hancock, who's the, the MP. We've been meeting at the, at the House of Commons, and he said at the end of the meeting, 
Um, and look, please take away a positive message and take it out to the industry because there are certain people here in this building, meaning Parliament, who want to pull up the, the drawbridge and stop this, you know, make us a little island again. So there are certainly forces within Westminster who don't see it your way and who actually want to make it a little England. Mm. You know, when his thing was take, you know, take this positive message out, and, but they didn't have a positive message. There's no positive message to take out. Mm. I think it's because we still are unclear about our status within the single market. Of course, yeah. And I think that, you know, I was speaking with a, a, an entrepreneur yesterday from, from the accessory sector who is, try, is, is now doing startups both in Britain and globally. And she was saying that she was just about to start in June of last year in the UK and now everybody's stalling, manufacturing, ev the funding, everything's stalling, whereas in other countries, and they're not just in Europe, they're global, she's, it's, it's going very quickly. Mm -hmm. So I, you know, like if if there was a guy that I was interested in, and for eleven months he had me stalling about what his mum thought or his auntie in Italy or you know, I'd be like, I'm off. You know, mm. like it, you start to switch off. So you oscillate. I think that that's you know, fashion people. We are very quick. We're very creative. Mm. We are very resilient. I have lived on insecure income for most of my adult life. So. You know, I didn't have really have a pay slip until I went to Westminster. I didn't really understand that I had holiday. You know, the whole thing was just new to me. Mm. So that I'm not unusual in the industry. I think and we yeah. are global. And that's what I've tried to, to say to people. I've, I've said to advisors, you know, we are the soft power. We represent that glamour, that, you know, there's mm. beautiful flowers here. This is a fantastic space. And we are mobile. My husband works mm. in the film industry. He could work for more money in other countries. Mm. And we're here at the moment with a child where the school's facing cuts. Mm. So I'm already worried about that future. And, and that's the worry. I, I love this country. I love this city. My father came here from somewhere else with nothing from Turkey and has made a great life here. I think it's the most beautiful, optimistic, resilient, country and we are the beautiful optimistic resilient people but we are faced with an uncertainty and if after 11 months i was in love with someone that was being a bit vague with me i would probably start looking over there at other other guys because mm. it's it's survival isn't it i think also you raise a really interesting point there which is about the instability within the the fashion industry that already exists, and you did raise this earlier on, with that your, it was a really intelligent point about things that all problems already exist, like cost of housing and you know access to studios and what have you. Yeah. And I think that's also a really important point to raise because it's amazing to hear you know, and we talk about doing the amazing lobbying and conversations that you've been having. But for a lot of our very young designers, you know, maybe three or four years out of college, who are building these amazing businesses, that you know. The UK prides itself on sort of wheeling out to show how interesting and creative we are. You know, they're working with maybe two other people, often from their apartments. Yeah. You know, they they don't have the resources all the time to actually get their voices heard because they can barely they barely have enough money to put together their collections. And I think that's a real problem. Is you know, some of your peers, Phoebe, and maybe yeah. some you will not have the time or the means to adequately put I across think, your opinion. Yeah, I think this is the problem. Is it is already. So so hard. I mean, it is really, really hard, really hard on a daily basis. And I think that's one, one of the de most devastating things is just realising it's going to get even mm. harder for us. It's, it's going to be really tough mm. and it's already really hard. And how many people are just going to be broken by that? On how many of them are actually just going to be like, I'm going to, about to where my parents live. Mm. It's going to be easy over there. I'm going to leave and just call it a day and do mm. it somewhere else and be really successful doing it somewhere where it's a lot easier. And you think of all of those, th and it, it's a loss that you can't measure in a way because yeah, it's not. It's not you a can't. Positive. Yeah, like whether you know who knows if someone of a McQueen like type another, talent doesn't start their own business yeah. that will have lost out on that because you would it's never like know. It's like another just like the last straw. Mm. It's really like. It could be the straw that breaks many camels' backs. Do you know what I mean? Mm. It's like it's already really hard. Mm. Here's something on top that's going to make it way harder for you. Mm. I think we, as, a, as an industry as a whole, we're not equally represented. You know, people like British Fashion, Fashion Council do a very good job for certain parts of the industry, but a large parts of the industry which are unrepresented, mm. unsupported. And often, you know, the people who are working in their bedrooms or whatever, producing a collection out of nothing. And those people are just not recognised at all. Mm. They, and they have, have no voice. voice. No, no voice, voice at all. 
Mm. And it's that, those sort of people. Well, I suppose that's a question for the associations and the yes, people who say that they yeah, represent it, the fashion it, industry. It, you know, that's part of the worry, is a sort of... Um, you know, I'm what, not sure if that's entirely true, but... Um, well, it, mm, I think maybe you would come back on that, Adam, and say actually we do represent. Well, but you do, but not all of it. I mean, you know, for the you know when McQueen started up, for instance, where, who was supporting him? Who his was friends. recognizing him? Yeah, his, the, his yeah. friends, and that was it. Mm. And you know, there were lots of young designers, our young struggling artists, trying to make ends meet, and then they work incredibly long hours. There's no structure in this industry. There's no union within this industry. You know, there's no. It's not like different industries. It's not like film. It's not like ballet. It's not like anything else. The fashion industry is driven by very young, very vulnerable artists. Yeah. Mm. You know, when you see question, them catapulted to power, yeah. like for instance, John going to D or McQueen getting his own brand, you can see how fragile those people are. Yeah. And that's where you end up with the problems that we've had with those people. So, you know, it is a very delicate industry. So there isn't a sort of government structure or lobbying voice mm. or anything like that that helps. There's no protection. But I do think, I do think this is a, there is a bigger problem with the creative industries and with some other industries as well, which is um, that it's not, a, it's not very good at looking after its own either. And, um, you know, you could argue that the government should do more, should, you know, pump more subsidies. Yeah. But there are some very big businesses who do extremely well and could give more back. Mm. Certainly on yep. skills and apprenticeships, I which we know in this country more. has completely dropped, yeah. partly because there is cheap labour from abroad. But will they be inclined to do that after Brexit, do you think? Do well, you, th you might ask the question about whether there should be more incentive for having apprentices and having mm. a much more structured training programme and encouraging businesses to do that, whether that's done by carrot and stick, whether it's done by mm. levies or you know, an apprenticeship levy and so on. But I don't think that, and I completely understand the concerns of any industry or individual designers like Phoebe who are worried about the future. In the short term, there are immediate risks. In the longer term, you know, I've made the, the bet myself that it will be better in the longer term for the, the whole country. Mm. But I also think that politically it's very important that London and London industries don't keep telling the rest of the UK that your problems are insignificant to our, compared to ours. Mm. You know, for a lot of other cities, a lot of other industries around the country, what they've seen is the, the loss of their industries, the loss of their jobs. They've seen people come in uh, undercutting their wages as they see it. And they see London in the middle of it all, complaining about the impact it's having on them. And I just think that that narrative is very damaging because it, that is you know, part of the problem, this idea that London's not listening to the rest of the country. I think there are other manufacturing businesses yeah. around, the, around the country that, you know, and some of those people will have voted to leave and they will have felt that they made the right decision for their business. So it's recognising that it's not, I don't think it's as monolithic as a lot of people present that their industry you know, steadfastly believes mm. one thing. I, I do think it's probably more mixed, but a lot of people, and I've seen this myself, do not speak out publicly. I know at least one significant person in fashion who sat me down at lunch during the campaign and said, look, I'm going to confess something that I've not told anybody else. I'm voting leave, and I absolutely think we should get out. Now, she won't say it to anyone else, but there will be people out there who believe the same thing. And did she say why? Just scared of what people will say, the impact No, no, did she say why she wanted to leave? EU is massively bureaucratic and anti-democratic and she thinks it's a, you know, it's, you know, you'd have to ask her. Right, I just wonder if she sort of summed up. I do think there's, um, I think there's a really interesting point that you make about how the creative industries can be perceived as very London-centric um, and I think that is obviously really important. Um, but one thing, and it kind of relates to something that is quite pragmatic, but I really want to talk about while I've got everyone here, which is this idea of, of manufacturing within the UK and something that can then be devolved out to these different communities and what have you, because the impression that I've got is that it's just simply not possible. You know, we're not, you, it's interesting that you, you, know, you make all your stuff in the UK, but you know, is it feasible that we're going to have, you know, you mentioned silk before and zips and what have you. Can you just give, for the sake of our viewers and kind of for me, a little breakdown of... Yeah, I mean, the, the feasibility of that. The manufacturing sector in the UK has been growing over the past sort of four or five years, and we've gone from a sort of low point of about 80,000 people employed across the whole of the UK, mm. and, I, and I accept the point about it's not just London. Um, you know, there are significant um, areas of manufacturing in Leicester, there's significant mm -hmm. areas of manufacturing in the Northwest, in Scotland, and in fact, you know, in the, in the West Midlands, um, all over the place. But there are a variety of things that are fundamentally difficult about manufacturing in the UK. Um, we don't have volume manufacturing left anymore. Mm -hmm. The volume manufacturing went uh, a significant mm -hmm. time, long time ago, um, and getting volume manufacturing back into the UK will be extremely difficult. Finding premises, finding the skilled workers, mm. um, 
training those workers up and I completely accept the point that we need to do more to, to in increase apprenticeship take up, we need to do a huge amount more to make manufacturing and creative industries and design and technology a embedded part of the national curriculum mm -hmm. going forward. I mean one of the reasons that the European workers that come over here, who by the way aren't low paid skilled workers, they are highly skilled workers, yeah. um, are, are brought into the UK is because they still have those latent skills. and. Yes, there is an opportunity to grow UK manufacturing, but it's a very long-term thing. You know, mm -hmm. we're not going to be able to fill that. Yeah. I, I accept the point that we don't know what's going to happen. Let's just say, for the sake of argument, that we're going to lose access to that European pool of talented workers. It's going to take a long time to train up our own domestic latent talent. And it's those sort of things, again, that we're looking for support and appreciation from, from governments of, of whatever colour. But, I mean, we make a variety of stuff in the UK. We produce just over £9 billion worth of product in the mm. UK in the fashion and textile industry. Everything from the shoes I'm wearing to the tie I'm wearing is made in the UK, but it's not just about fashion, it's about the nose cones on Formula One race mm. uh, cars, it's about textiles that go into the road building, it's about textiles mm. that go into the aerospace industry. We make stuff for every single part but of the industry. But for textiles, the, U, the EU is our biggest export, isn't it? Yeah, yeah the EU accounts for 74% of all of our exports for, mm -hmm. for fashion and textiles, so it's, it's a huge So is that a concern at the moment, is also th focusing on growing our manufacturing but not knowing where we're going to be able to export it? Well, it, it's, it's partly that and it's also partly the difficult relationship between UK manufacturing and the UK retail scene. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the retail buyers that are currently within a lot of the major high street um, shops and stores don't know what's on their doorstep, mm -hmm. don't know that dealing with a manufacturer that employs a hundred people is very different from dealing with a manufacturer mm. who employs thousands and thousands of people in China or, or Burma or wherever else it might be. So there is a, there's a real disconnect between retail and manufacturing. There are some great examples, ASOS is one, of where they work very closely with UK manufacturers to upskill them, they put a lot of money into skills and training, and they are growing their UK manufacturing base, partly because, to be frank, they want to de-risk their supply chain. Mm -hmm. They don't want the issues of finding that they've got children working in their um, factories that they're working with in places like Turkey, and they'd much rather work with the people that they can get in the car and drive up to Leicester or jump on the tube mm -hmm. and go into the guys in, in London and understand that what's going through the the process both in terms of quality and in terms of employer, employing correctly and paying national minimum wage and living mm. wages all being done. So there are opportunities there but there are difficulties. Mm -hmm. Understanding what the export market is going to be, understanding what the implications of import tariffs will be on the pricing structure, dealing with retail, getting them to understand how the UK manufacturing mm. is different. So there's, there's all sorts of issues but absolutely there are opportunities to, to grow the manufacturing base here. Phoebe, do you feel protected or concerned given that your stuff is, is made within the UK? Um, well, I suppose, yeah, I'm probably a bit unusual because I do make everything in the UK uh, despite being repeatedly advised not to <laughs> um, for several years now. Um, and I, I make it here because it is close to me and it makes sense to make it here and because it uh, reduces the fuel use to, to ship things. And I believe that wherever you can try and save that then you should um, but there are things within my manufacturing that I can't do here so for example particular types of fabric I can't get from UK mills because there's such a small amount of fabric made in the UK I'm right aren't I yeah <laughs> it, it depends hard. what type of fabric yeah I mean yeah. very very expensive luxury fabric is easy to find in the UK but if you want, you know, a plain shirting fabric, that's harder. So there are things, and again, zips, buttons, things like that I have to get from other places. Um, so kind of making everything here doesn't mean that I don't need to go anywhere mm. else to find things in order to get a finished product. Mm. I'm going to set up a zip manufacturing business. <laughs> I'll join you. That sounds it's great. We can all live in a zip so utopia together. Yeah, zips are a constant battle. Um, but yeah. I'm conscious of time, but I'm interested, I, I'm interested, you know, a lot of us have talked about this idea that we don't know what's going to happen. I think it'd be really interesting to end this on a note of looking forward and it can be, you know, a big hope or it can be something really specific that you'd like to see addressed. I'm just interested in moving forward what, what everyone's main short-term or long-term concern is and something that they feel is really, like any closing notes that you have basically tomorrow. I know that's a huge question, you've probably got a manifesto that you'd like to deliver. So, first of all, the creative education needs to be 
in the DNA of the education remit for this country so mm -hmm. that we can boost our own talent. Second of all, we have to be looking to invest in manufacturing. Mm -hmm. Third of all, we have to look at our tariffs. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, Matt Hancock brought up how Hong Kong has zero, zero tariffs. We have to start looking. We also have to try to work out a way of enticing big business to have their taxation here mm -hmm. and then try to offset, I think, that with some kind of investment strategy, apprentice strategy for them to invest in the smaller industries and the SMEs. Mm. I think that, that the two have to go hand, but we have to start bringing people in <laughs> instead of fleeing. Mm -hmm. um, we also have to address the sustainability issue, which Bobi just highlighted, because that is, that is protected under EU law. Um, Baroness Young was very concerned at the first round table, who heads up the sustainability or party group, about losing that protection. Yep. Uh, you it's know, really the air miles of, of export when it's further, when it's a different culture, when it's a different body shape, when it's a different history from Europe is an aspect to any future export business. And, you know, flying something to China, flying something to America, flying something to India, I agree we're already importing massively from them. Mm. But if we're going to start exporting, you know, we, that adds up air miles. So that's also, and, and you, we've just got to work on those protections as well. Mm. Any final note? You um, look slightly no, defeated. No, 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 not at all. No, I mean, it's a great discussion. Um, if I thought that we were going to lose 74% um, of our exports because we weren't trading with the EU anymore, I wouldn't have voted to leave either. I don't think that's going to happen. Okay. Um, and actually, you know, if you look at the bigger picture, since the, EU, since the UK joined the single market, our exports to the EU have not gone as fast as other countries that are outside the single market. I mean, there's a lot of myths about how good the single market has been for the UK. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, lots of economists have debated that issue. Actually, the country that we export the most to creative industries wise mm -hmm. is the US. EU as a whole, you know, the, the, the numerous member states are larger. But actually, the US is a massive export market for the creative industries. We have no trade deal with them yet. And the EU has not been great at doing trade deals with these other big export markets. So I think there are opportunities. opportunities. But I completely take the point, and I agree with everyone here, that it does mean that we have to be much more strategic about how we grow our industries, how we grow our trade, how we grow our exports. The problem has been for a long time that the EU has, A, taken away a lot of that function. Mm -hmm. So we've not had, we've not thought for ourselves, we've not really done it. Mm -hmm. The money that goes into regional development is given to the EU to give back to us. I think we should control our regional development and we would do it much more intelligently. I worked in regional government and I know for a fact that we were distributing money much better than Whitehall would have. I do think these things work better often, closer mm -hmm. to home. I, you know, and I, you know, I think there are risks as with any strategy, if we'd remained in the EU, we might be having a very different discussion about what's going to happen. Yeah. Um, so, uh, I, you know, I, I'm optimistic about many things, but I don't pretend at all that it's plain sailing. But, you know, nothing in life is. The two key things, I think, that if you're asking me what the benefits could be, international trade is absolutely one of them. US prime example. I mean, we export about 325 million pounds worth of fashion and textile products to the US. US pro UK products in the US is about 25-35% more expensive in the US than it would be in the mm. UK mm -hmm. because of all sorts of technical issues in terms of imports and all the rest of it. If we could get a free trade deal with the US as an example, then that would be a fantastic, huge opportunity for this industry. And the other area where we could probably have a significant impact is if we could make our public procurement look towards our UK manufacturers. Mm -hmm. The yeah. US, again, yeah. brilliant yeah. example. We're not allowed to the, US, mm -hmm. the US military, everything the US military wear has to be made in America. Mm -hmm. How cool would it be if everything that the UK military had to wear was made in the UK? Get them in Phoebe English, they'd look very <laughs> snazzy. <laughs> <laughs> wow, a new, new area. <laughs> um, Any final notes? For yeah, I think for me it's um, ta talent um, and yeah, just as a closing point, I um, would like to talk about my own experience of the Erasmus programme um, and how much it changed, fundamentally changed my life, not only as a person, but as a designer. Um, I mean, it was an opportunity. I spent, you know, nine months in Paris and three months in New York, and there's no way I would be the, the person I am now without having that money to give me the opportunity to be in those incredible places and train under amazing designers. Um, so I really hope that if we and when we lose Erasmus 
there is something else that's set up in its place because I cannot, I cannot stress enough how, how life changing that experience was coming from a family that would no way have been able to fund my, my year living abroad. It was an incredible opportunity. Um, so I really hope that when we do lose it, there's something else set up. I've, in got, to, I've got to interrupt, sorry. There are loads of non-EU countries that participate in Erasmus. We can continue to pay in. So I, I, you know, I agree, it's a brilliant scheme. We should keep being part of it. We, there's no reason it's why really we should It's really important, it's really important. I mean, that was just talking to students this year who know they might not get it. I mean, they're just totally distraught. Cause it's such a, it's such a life-enhancing um, mm. thing to be able to do, and career-enhancing, of course, as well. Um, yeah, that's my, my main... Thing. Nick, any final...? Any final thoughts? Um, try and be positive. Um, I think the one thing that perhaps... One, and I do actually like to be positive um, and optimistic. The one thing I think that is positive coming from all of this is the fact that government are now listening to what the fashion industry is about rather than scandalising and trivialising it. And I think that goes to some degree for the British media, who have largely been responsible for the very bad uh, view of what the fashion industry actually is. So I think now they realise that we put in £28 million, billion pounds into the economy per year, and I think the government actually listening and trying to find out who people like Phoebe are, mm. you know, how it works, etc., etc. that's beneficial, I think. Mm. So a little bit more of another, I'm, I'm kind of very much for, from, rather than creative industries, I'm kind of much from the fashion industry. Um, although it's part of it, but I think that's really important. Fashion's had a very poor deal um, and a very, very poor understanding of actually what it does and the artists that work within it. Mm. So I think support, if, it, you know, if that comes from this, then mm. that'll be a good thing. I think that's a really good point. And on your topic of just conversation, you know, the importance of discussion, I think that's something that'd be really great is that if our viewers can respond to this and post in the YouTube comments and we can feed that back and because yeah. you know, we work a lot, with, a lot of our viewers are within the industry, so it'd be really interesting to hear what other people say. Um, thanks so much for joining. It was really, it was fantastic to have people who have such different areas of expertise and obviously different opinions. I think that's really, really important in these kind of discussions. You used the word echo chamber before, and I think what's really interesting about this is that I think we've had, we've allowed a sort of an open forum to hear from different perspectives. I want to end with a quote from Andrew Groves, who is a brilliant, brilliant quarters director of the BA in fashion at the University of Westminster and an amazing man. Mm. Um, and I think. We all talked about optimism, and I think it's a nice note to end on. And he, he said, at the end of the day, I'm hopeful. We are a creative industry, and we always react to things in a creative manner, which is normally a positive manner, however it's expressed. So I think that's something to take away. So thank you so much, everyone, for thank joining you. us.